I was being threatened for my life. It got really, really dark. It became like, we're gonna go to your house and, and kill you. I can't even imagine. I was thinking, Jesus, <laughs> where are you? I feel like really frightened for you even now. I just wanna read a few of the things that the judges said. Will I am said that you're the real deal. Welcome to God TV Together, the podcast. I'm joined today by a new friend, uh, Benjamin Haycock. Benjamin, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, mate. Yes, it is. Really, really nice of you to join us. Uh, for those of you listening at home, um, Benjamin is a artist, a music artist. He's also a Christian. So he might not like me if I call him a Christian artist, but he is a Christian and he is a music artist. You may not have heard of his songs before, but you know, hopefully today we're going to get the heart of who Benjamin is, a little bit about his music, but mostly about how God has impacted his life and not just worked in him, but he's now working through him. Um, Benjamin is a serious music artist. Um, he has done some amazing tracks and he's also been involved in a TV show that we mm -hmm. will talk about later. But it's like I said before, Benjamin, you know, I don't really want to um, major yeah. on, you know, what you've done somewhere else because we want to focus on like who you are and what you're doing now. And, yeah. you know, so so the question is, is like, who is Benjamin Haycock and, yeah. you know, where did it all start? Mm. It's quite a question to start on. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm from Birmingham, so I'm from a little place called Erdington in Birmingham, not far from Aston, um, where Aston Villa play, the famous Aston Villa, not far from there down the road. Um, so all my family are, are from Birmingham. Um, pretty similar kind of area to, have you watched Peaky Blinders before? Quite a similar kind of thing in terms of, uh, you know, it's, it's inner city, suburban kind of place. A lot of the northern towns, which I'm sure being from Burnley, you're aware of, it's quite similar to that, to be fair. Um, but yeah, just a, a kid and only child from there. So I was into music and football, really. Um, probably going into a separate thing here, but did a lot of football before the music. So I was doing it simultaneously. Um, and I heard you were pretty good at football. I was all right. I was all right. So I played for Birmingham City Academy growing up, then played for Futsal, which is like this five-a-side uh game really invented in South America which kind of took over over here in Birmingham they've got the biggest facility in England so I played for Birmingham won a few FA youth medals growing up and that was kind of what I wanted to do um, but I'm sure you'll you'll hear kind of the story why I've gone into music and, and other matters really but um, still love football um, but yeah I'm gonna let you ask the questions I think before I go into too much oh no you just talk away <laughs> like Benjamin I'm really happy to sit and listen to you because I've already got a thousand questions. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. I, I mean, so um, where, where did you grow up in Birmingham and what was that like? I grew up in Erdington. Erdington, as I said, is a very working class kind of inner city suburban place. Um, it straggles the line really between proper inner city Birmingham and kind of half of Erdington is that. That's where I grew up in a place called Stockland Green, not too far from Erdington, but it's within Erdington itself. Um, it's got its deprivation, it's got its problems like anywhere, um, like any real place in England, like anywhere in the world really. Um, it's got its nicer places and also some that are not so nice. You know, there's a lot of deprivation, a lot of people who were struggling, particularly over the last few years. When I grew up, there was definitely people who were who were in dark places. Um, and I kind of traversed that a bit in my teens as well. I've got quite a few stories about that. Um, got caught up in quite a bit of it as well. Um, there's a lot of gangs, there's a lot of as I said, drugs and, and, and things of that nature, which unfortunately in a, in, in a very kind of community-based place exist. Yeah, um, everywhere, you know, everywhere. Everywhere, mate, everywhere. Bur Burnley included, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, it just concentrates in, in certain areas. It does, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so Christian home, non-Christian home? Christian home, so grew up as an only child, like I said. Um, Mum and dad were Christian. Um, my dad was incredibly you were saying about you're an evangelicalist he used to create these banners so he would create um these flags for people who don't know what banners are like it's maybe a thing of the past but created he'd done his own artwork so he was an artist so he painted jesus on these banners painted wonderful visions and dreams that he had on canvases too um, but also on banners and would portray them throughout the services so you know the the, the more crescendos within the music he'd be up and down like dancing right. and waving the banner and right. um he'd really get into it so he was he was, he was a wonderful guy, which was, um, which was a strong Christian. My mum, who's still with us, um, she's a wonderful Christian. She's name's Denise. Her name's Denise, sorry. Um, 
uh, we kind of grew up in an evangelical church. Uh, I played football, as I said, and was in a gospel church for quite a bit in the center of Birmingham when I played on the mornings, right. Sunday mornings growing up. Right. So me and my dad went to a, a gospel church, which was interesting, musically, very dynamic, jazz cores and the rest of it, and got introduced to a lot of the, the, the drummer and tone, and I'll go into a bit more musical background later. But um, yeah, so both both were Christian, very lovely Christian home, surrounded by quite a, quite a dark area in some ways as well. Um, which weren't Christian, so that was kind of interesting, traversing that. But yeah. What what was it like uh, for you growing up as a Christian? You know, did you know Jesus the whole mm. time? You know, um, you know, did you lose him a bit? Sort of, you know, yeah. like what did you believe? You know, uh, young Benjamin mm. hasn't quite hit secondary school, so yeah, still yeah. very influenced by his parents. You know, what? how would you say your faith was? I, I would say, man? yeah, no, it's a good question. I was, probably until the age of secondary school, I was quite steadfast in my faith growing up in a Christian home. Um, I think when I hit secondary school, it was a bit more difficult. Um, There's a lot of things that were happening at the time. Um, I was involved in, I got involved in quite a lot of the darker things, let's say, um, when I was kind of 12, 13, yeah, seven, mostly R8 and nine, Mm. um, which involved kind of, you know, it was through rapping actually, really interestingly. Um, So I got involved in kind of a group which were involved in beef with another group. And it just became this thing where there were a lot of, uh, there's a lot of violence at the time, Um, people carrying knives and, you know, I'm sure we'll go into that a bit more later, but that really tested my faith. And actually, I think that was probably one of the darkest points in my life. I've been through a lot, but I would say that was probably one of the darkest, because just just because I was so young, really. Yeah. Um, Being an only child, I felt like I've always had that kind of, cathartic expression in terms of prayer and songwriting that I've been really blessed by because you didn't have many people all the time to speak to. Most of my friends were non-Christian. I had quite a few good Christian friends, but you know, whenever I went out for a, you know, a walk in the park or we used to go on holiday to Devon, where we're at now, um, we used to go to the beach and I used to pray quite a lot. So I've always had quite a close relationship with Jesus. Right. It's got tested a lot over the years, don't get me wrong. Yeah. Um, it really has. And it, it still gets tested every now and then, but I think I've... I've, I've remained consistent within my prayer um, and my walk with Jesus has definitely been more of a relational one than, than necessarily going to church all the time when I was in my teens. Yeah, yeah, it's good. It's good. So so um, or, or, order the story for me a little bit. So mm. you've got, uh, you are going to church, mm. you're interested in the music, yep. you're playing football. Mm. So um, what sort of age is that? And then, you know, yep. when did the sort of rapping and, you know, yeah, so when I was when I went to secondary school, so until then, kind of it's fairly normal to be honest. Um, I didn't really know many of the of, of the I didn't know the extent necessarily of the deprivation and really some of the things were happening in the area at the time. Obviously, because I'm a kid, I'm probably a bit naive. Mm. I didn't really get exposed to it until secondary school. Mm. So when I when I went to secondary school, I think my my kind of journey changed football wise as well. Began playing for Birmingham City Academy. I got scouted when I was around eleven, so it kind of coincided with that. Um, but I also got involved in rap. So fairly inner city school, very multicultural. There's a lot of rap going on. It was the main genre, to be honest. Yeah. Um, started playing drums initially and then got more enthused, really, with rap. I don't think I've ever met a Brummie rapper before. I'm yeah. sure they exist, but... Oh, mate, they exist in abundance. <laughs> if you're going to research anything after this, anyone viewing this, it would do be Do you rap rapper. in a Brummie accent? Uh, it started off a bit more London, I Yeah, say. yeah, right. But my, my Brummie accent has kind of toned down a bit, so it's naturally that's toned down as well. I don't think I've ever really rapped in a very Brummy accent because I was so influenced by London. It was right. more neutral. Right. I'm not saying I had like a Cockney accent or anything. No, no, no. <laughs> I know, it was when you sing or you... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you... Certain syllables would be very kind of almost Cockney. Right. So I've had people almost pull me out in comments like, are you from Birmingham after yeah. all? <laughs> yeah. But it's just certain syllables, you know, which are yeah. quite interesting. So, so you had a lot sort of happen for you all at once, I guess, around yeah. secondary school, your... Yeah playing football at quite a high level mm. uh, and you're um, getting into like quite a, I guess a difficult genre for a Christian boy. Absolutely. And I think, I think that's probably where my faith maybe went a bit backwards in that year or two. So I was only obviously 11 to 13, but within that time, a lot happened. So the beginning of that, as I said, joining Birmingham, that was a big thing in and of itself. Um, my dad had to kind of, it was in Chalmsley, what I'm from Erdington. 
Um, and I'm sure maybe not many people are from Birmingham watching this. So it was the other side of Birmingham, which is like half an hour away. So we'd finish work, you know, on a Tuesday evening and have to drive me all the way. And it was it was a lot. So that, that was something that we had to consider. Um, but the rapping started within really the playgrounds. So I was in like a bit of a clique and we used right. to have like rap battles and we used to write together. So it was less musical then and more kind of what we could include within the lyrics. The lyrics weren't great, if I'm right. honest, in terms of content as well. And I think that's when really my faith maybe was on the back burner. Um, so I got involved in this click really and just people within my school who were really good at rapping. And we went to a studio one day and tried to record a track together over this instrumental. And um, there was this guy who was like in year 10 or 11 at the time. So 16-ish, 15, 16, and obviously we were 12. And um, recorded this track, put it on MySpace at the time. You know, yeah. anyone below you know, It's not old enough to know what MySpace is. You know, <laughs> Facebook, of, Facebook the of the past. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So uh, it was on there and it went kind of, it kind of went viral around my school. So it was just one of these things where everyone was talking about it. Um, and for whatever reason, my kind of verse stood out, whether it was because I was a drummer and I had perhaps a bit more rhythm than the rest of them, I don't know. Um, but the guy who recorded the producer kind of scouted me for his group at the time. So it was called TTO, he's like the talented ones, I think it was. Um, I was the only kind of 12, 13 year old. The rest of them were like 16, 17, which was pressure in and of itself. None of them Christians or anything. Yeah. Um, and then I started to go to the studio. So I started to go to his house after school and we produced together and I was on a lot of the tracks. What I didn't know at the time, not to go into this straight away, but what I didn't know at the time is they had quite a bit of beef with another group from another school. Um, what do you mean beef? Uh, you know, violent conflicts, they would meet up and fight and they were kind of dissing each other, which is a, it's a part of the rap community, but it was more personal. Um, so embedded within the lyrics was kind of like, we're going to do this, we're going to carry a knife and take it to yours. And But then it, it was also quite dark and I didn't realise I was involved in these tracks, saying also some things I shouldn't have said because I was just like following these 17 year olds, 16, 17 year olds who I thought were bigger than me. And, you know, I looked up to them. Yeah. So I was definitely being influenced in terms of lyrics wise, but... It, it became dark. It became like, we're going to go to your house and, and kill you and, you know, burglar. And it got really, I won't go into too much, but it got really, really dark yeah, um, the to the point yeah. where physically it started to kind of erupt within the local vicinity. So they would come to kind of where we were studio wise. They would try and find our kind of houses and intimidate us. Um, and it got to the point basically, and I was the only real 12, 13 year old and they was all smoking weed. And, and I wasn't at that point, um, I wasn't doing any of that, but I was just sitting in there like in bedroom full of like 10 other guys who were kind of smoking weed, had knives on them and the rest of it really. Um, and it got to a situation, long story short, where I was being threatened for my life. I had a phone at the time, which was this ridiculous like flip phone that I used to have. And I was getting like 15, 20 calls every few hours. Um, and the voice notes were like, or the voicemails were like, we're gonna kill you, we're gonna come to your house with a knife and and rape your mom and and like almost pillage, burglar all your house and, and then kill you. Um, so I was as a 12, 13 year old, like I'd never experienced anything like this before. And I'd never really got exposed to the fact it can happen. I can't, I can't even imagine. Mate. How, how did it feel? Genuinely, mate, it was the it was the most fearful point of my life. Like it was, I was scared stiff. I was listening to these voicemails and I wouldn't tell my mom anything either or my dad because my dad would just go crazy and I didn't want anything. It's, you've got to understand in some of these communities and I know a lot of people do, but kind of, it's that snitches thing, isn't it? It's like, if you tell the police, like he would have, my parents would have, of course, they would have rang someone like the police. Immediately. Immediately. And that would have probably got me involved in a lot more trouble and had things actually to my door, which would have been more convoluted. So people would have threw eggs at my house and stones, which in the end it was getting to that, but I'll get onto that in a minute. But um, mate, I was genuinely scared for my life. Like um, it got to the point where I, I told my mom this was happening for about a month. So almost every day it was affecting my schoolwork. My friends in school heard about it. So they, there was rumors across the school being like a footballer, I was relatively popular in the school at the time. So all of a sudden it went from Benjamin, this footballer, to this kid who is also this musician, rapper, hanging about with all these guys from another school um, that was also involved in some quite serious stuff. So I ended up having a bit of a reputation and then it got to the point, as I said, where I was getting all these calls and everything. It culminated in this one day um, where I think it was like the night before it, um, I got a call basically saying, we're coming the next day to your house and we're gonna slash your name and your forehead, um, we're gonna come in, we're gonna rape your mom, we're gonna do all of this. And 
my mom, they, they found out my home number for the first time. And my mom knew very little about this. She knew bits and pieces. She didn't know the extent of it. And she picked up the phone and was just like, she just cried in front of me. So she went through, hey, how you doing? To suddenly just like tears down her face. Um, and basically they said everything I've just said to you to her. So she put the phone down and was like, what the heck is this? Yeah. So we went to this guy's house who was the producer who kind of culminated all of this and scouted me, so to speak. Um, and yeah, he, he basically said that he couldn't do nothing. It was out of his hands. It was like, at the time, I think he was scared and the people that uh, around me were scared at the time. And they were 16, 17. I mean, I was a 12, 13 year old lad being threatened by these 16, 17 year old guys with knives and the morning after that, so he couldn't do anything. The morning after that, I went to football training and I got a text before I went to football training from my friend, um, an old friend who I don't really speak to now, but he sent me a picture of uh, a screwdriver that the guy was holding up in the park and said that this is going to be within your forehead by the end of the day. We're coming. Um, so I was just in fear and I went to football training and just like, I couldn't tell anyone. I didn't want to tell my mom at the time. The worst thing was there was a guy who went to their school who was um who went to my football and he, he told me he said yeah we all know about it mate just be careful and so i, I was just bemused i came back um my mom was there my, and my dad was out which for me was like the worst thing because i was like you know the one person who probably could protect me in this scenario yeah at least offer as a buffer and not answer the door was wasn't there um i think he went to oh, went to the shop or something something ridiculous i don't even remember right um, two of my old best friends, a couple of girls came to my house and I wouldn't have went out the door because I knew what was going to happen, but they come in and kind of drew me out, those two, because they were friends with them too. Bit kind of snakeish, if I'm honest, in terms of that. I was very, I was very angry with that post-it. So, so um, they came in your house to make you yeah. leave? Yeah, they, they basically said that they're not going to do anything. Nothing's going to happen. They put me on the phone with them and the guys who were outside, I could see them out my window. My bedroom window was like on the street. So I could see them out the corner just waiting, like on the bikes. Um, there were 15, 16, as I said. Um, I think one of them was like 17. And yeah, they drew me out basically. I went out and it was, um, yeah, it was just like back and forth. And then all of a sudden when they kind of got me around the corner, it was very much like, this is what we're going to do to you. Um, what have you been doing? They com basically culminated all of these lies, which didn't happen. Yeah. Mate, I was ridiculously... Well, it's a truth then. You know, they, they've yeah. said this has happened. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They, they said, I, I said this to threaten them. Right. And I, I, I was... So some, as I've said, some of the things within my songs were provocative because I was... Influ and that's that's the thing about it, right? Is at the time, you're just kind of following along with it, thinking this is cool. Are you in a studio with all your mates? We're in a studio. Well, not even my mates, mate. These are 16, 17 yeah. year old and they're rapping about the type of thing. So when I'm writing about it, you're kind of rapping about similar things. The problem is that when I spoke to them, I was like, okay, I've wrote all of this. Shouldn't have wrote it. I was like, I don't have a flipping clue about this. You know, barely had a fight in my life. Yeah. And then all of a sudden he's threatening me um, and saying that you've said this, pulls out this screwdriver puts it up to my um, stomach and it's just like, listen, if you don't do these things, if you don't say these things, I won't go into that, um, then we're gonna basically cut you open. And I was like, oh, mate, I'm not, I'm not saying it, man. And I was just, and you know what? It's the, it's the most crazy thing at the time, but in my head, genuinely, I was thinking, Jesus, <laughs> where are you? You know, come, come please in this moment and just do something. Um, and actually not long after my um my oh, mum today yeah my my mum um and she never was in my room but i think she was curious at where i'd gone because i didn't really leave the house that much for periods and she went out the window and was just like and she saw this screwdriver and she was like ben and um the guy just basically floored me give me a little dig like a swinging punch as i was on the way down and then just went off on their bikes um but it was one of those moments i think if if Definitely if she wasn't there. Mm. And and I believe if I didn't have that thought in my head, like, Jesus, please, <laughs> please, um, please be here. Do do something kind of thing that, you know, it, it, it was divine intervention in that moment. And I think really any point in my life that I've kind of experienced a feeling like that or something's happened, it's that moment. And I never forget that, mate, because that changed me until then. Yeah, um, I mean, I, it must change you today. I mean, that's... yeah. A traumatic event i mean yeah how how has that impacted you and how does it still impact you today 
Yeah, I, I'd probably say less so now, but at the time it was a case that for a few weeks the calls continued. And the thing is they knew where I live now. So it was worse almost for a couple of weeks afterwards. Um, I found out afterwards that this guy who was kind of hanging about with at the time, who was quite a prolific gang member and has suddenly become a, actually he's in prison now for um, attempted murder. He's gone completely the wrong way. As I could have done in that environment, you know? I mean, we were all growing up in the same place and we were involved in the wrong thing. Um, and he, he threatened them off. And I never knew until years later that he just suddenly kind of stopped. Right. But because he had cousins who were in like one of the biggest gangs in Birmingham, but I never had any of that. <laughs> so he was like, listen, Ben's our mate. We haven't saw him in a few weeks. And I think a lot of people ended up doing similar things. So it kind of petered out. But I ended up basically having people wait outside of school for me. Um, and it was, I had to kind of leave early a couple of times. And my school was, I love my school, but it was quite rough as well. So, and because I was relatively popular because of football, everyone knew what was happening and lies were getting perpetuated that kept on going round. Yeah, so um, then it becomes a rumour mill because it's exciting to talk yeah, about yeah. Benjamin Haycock and yeah. all these issues that are happening. Yeah. So I, I left school just before the summer um, and then was homeschooled for about a half a year after. Yeah, wow. Um, because basically the school teacher just said, listen, we can't protect you outside of school. There's too many kids here. Yeah. Um, maybe take a break out. And my parents were like, listen, we, we need to do something at this stage. Yeah. My dad was like, he's going out of the school, like it's perpetuating this. And so I was homeschooled for about half a year and then went back. Um, but yeah, mate, that, that was a big, big thing growing up. It definitely has influenced a lot of things. And before then, in all fairness, before they haven't really touched on this because I didn't interlude into it, the things that I was getting involved in with those older guys was pretty serious in and of itself. Like yeah. I've said, a few of them went to prison. A few of them ended up brilliantly, like the brilliant lads. And uh, one of them actually, who was kind of on the outskirts of it, ended up becoming one of my groomsmen. He's a lot older and he was he was a Christian. He went to a gospel church. and But he was going through a lot of the time as well. And I don't think anyone really knew the extent of it because I didn't tell anyone. So I felt really alone in that period. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, we're glad you're here today and... Sorry to go into that straight away. But no, no, kind of just... don't apologise. Honestly, um, I feel like really frightened for you even now because I can just imagine like young mm. Benjamin. You're still young, you know, but but just I uh, can't imagine how hard that was. And, you know, I'm glad you had Jesus in your life, yeah. you know. Um, but, I mean, it must have been terrifying. And uh, for sure it's got to have impacted some of your music and, mm. you know, like your compassion and... Mm consideration stuff Absolutely. like that grows you up you know yeah um so yeah benjamin you know so you you have this period but i guess you had music come into your life at that mm. point you know yeah absolutely uh, yeah. you know rapper you said you were a drummer yeah so you've gone from being a soccer player <laughs> yeah and uh, you know uh, a mini criminal or gang member or yeah, whatever yeah. you want to call it for yeah. the story's sake mm. um how, how does music become like a key part of your life yeah i think it becomes cathartic almost a cathartic expression if not anything else it was an expression of what, what do you what do you mean by a cathartic expression so something that was within me that obviously i didn't speak about much at the time right. because mate i when i left school i mean and this is a thing that kind of relates as well with jesus is that i left all my friends who were secular behind at that point right um so like all of them who were in my school and i had quite a lot of friends who would come i was an only child so a lot of the friends that were close to me were like brothers so it was yeah. difficult but enough was happening and enough people said enough stuff <laughs> that it kind of made i had a clean break i needed to at the time so i ended up going to this youth group um which was at, i was in a vineyard at the time i went to the gospel church and we went to vineyard and um and it was it was a really important period really of growth in terms of connecting myself to jesus getting through a lot of it um relying on jesus instead of thinking i can do this myself and you know, I can get to the point where I go back to school and, you know, integrate within the friendship group and the rest of it and, and almost get over it and get away from the fear that almost being a recluse was for about half a year. I'm not going to, there was times in that year that was really difficult. And I, I bring this up because that reclusive nature of me staying in my house and not really going out in the local area, unless I went to football training when my dad used to drive us across town or vineyard was in a bit of a better area in Sutton. So 10, 15 minutes away. Um, I just wrote, I, I was listening to a lot of rap at the time still, I was really influenced by it still. And I wrote some of the most powerful <laughs> lyrics that I probably ever wrote um, that I'd love to share if I had them, um, just about what I went through. I've still got them now on like an old hard drive somewhere, right. or an old like USB stick that I've never, like somewhere in my, my old mom's house. And um, 
yeah, it was just a period of writing and writing and writing um, to the point where I felt like that was the only thing I could do. Prayer, prayer was a big thing, but a lot of the time, because I couldn't go out, I, al I always tend to pray better when I'm in nature and when I'm going for a walk, etc. So a lot of the times where I felt really on my own, I'm not gonna lie, pen and a pad, writing as much as possible um, was really important. Before then as well, my dad used to um, listen to a lot of kind of like Phil Wickham and Cry, and we used to go to a Creation Fest, which I'll touch on later, um, most summers in, in Cornwall. Right. It was Wollacombe at the time, North Devon. Um, and I used to have a lot of influence. I thought, you know, I could probably do a lot of Christian stuff as well. So I started being influenced by a few of these artists. So that culminated in a writing style that I didn't even know I had at the time, but I was like social issues, commentary, kind of just like, as I said, cathartic expression about what I've been through, pouring my heart out. And I think I haven't really stopped. <laughs> right. so, well, can, you, just, know. you just talked about your music style and obviously if people haven't listened to it, what would you, how would you describe it? Because I think I'd struggle to describe it. I do too, mate. I do too. I mean, let's have a go. Let's have a go together. You know, on Spotify, so when you have to like distribute music, yeah. every track, when there's a track with like rapping and there's folk stuff and there's a lot of guitar, what do I do? Yeah, <laughs> I just yeah. say singer songwriter with yeah. whatever the secondary genre is. Um, th there's elements of kind of indie folk, kind of Newton Faulkner, there's elements of, um, I guess, kind of percussive guitar. So John Garm, Ben Howard, that kind of vocal percussive folk style. Um, used to listen to a lot of kind of Phil Wickham which, and Tom York. So the big highs and the bouts that I used to love listening to, I've kind of incorporated that. Never really found out I had that in my arsenal until I was about 16, 17, I'm not gonna lie. Um, listen to those guys really tried to do it, like Matt Corby kind of thing. Um, but then with rap, so it's very much a, I don't know if you've ever listened to like Mike Righteous or Akala. Um, so they're kind of secular artists, but they're conscious rappers really, but just their like flow and their dynamic range. And it's, 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 that's very much how I tell the story through rap. So that's all combined. So you've got this element of folky, percussive, twiddly bits like John Butler almost on guitar. You've got the vocals, which can be, quite husky or quite kind of range in terms of falsettos and highs. And then within pretty much maybe 70% of my songs, some songs are only singing or a lot of guitar, uh, maybe 75% of my songs are rap based as well. So I would include yeah. at least one verse. And within that verse would be the most expressive part of it where I tell a story, whether it's about me or, or, or social commentary or something that I'm going through. And that's really the thread within my music is that there's always usually somewhere within the song that I'm kind of being really real about yeah. an issue or yeah. about something I've been through. Yeah. So you, you described it before we started as like serious. Yeah. But like I, I like I think it's driven by like what's your desire? You know, what why are you driven to be, you know, quote unquote serious in your music? Mate, it's it's difficult. Obviously, I think most of the music I listened to growing up um was serious. I think that was the nature of it, to be honest, is that I mean, we'll go on to my dad in a minute, but when kind of I lost my dad, I was listening to a lot of really depressing music for a long time and I was 16 then. And that's when I started to play guitar really. Right. Um, so I think in terms of guitar work, that probably influenced a lot of that. Mm. And when the instrumental becomes quite dark and enthused with a lot of sadness, then ultimately your lyrics do too. Right. And that's one point. But also I've just been through a lot and I was I was influenced a lot by people like Akala growing up and Logic the UK rapper, Mike Righteous, who rapped about serious topics, um, social issues, um, social commentary, a lot of it, to be honest, conscious rap type of thing. But that's the rap I was interested in. I was never really interested in the kind of mainstream rap at the time, which was probably like Tinchy Schrider or like Tiny Temper, which became mainstream right. or Professor right. Green, maybe. That's right. kind of my generation. Dizzy, it was Dizzy more Rascal. Dizzy Rascal. Uh, all of them are incredible, don't get me wrong. Like, yeah. I love listening to them but I was never influenced by them in terms of musical. Um, Akala's became this incredible kind of um, bastion for social commentary and historical commentary within his lyrics is incredible. One of the most biggest influences to me in terms of rap style and content. And he was always rapping about like what happened in colonial days. And it's like listening to that, you get a kind of different element than just right. listening to pop music. Right. Um, but then also really serious um, issues about social commentary, like I said, that that really did, did, I suppose, influence me. But I've just, I think, I think I've just been through enough not to sit down and um, write about it. And I think when I'm in a good mood, I probably don't end up picking a pen and a pad. I just don't. <laughs> like, I think when I'm with a band and we're jamming, that's when I create a bit more kind of upbeat music. And there's a lot of 
a bit of music that I've got in my arsenal, but most that I've actually released and I felt that it's poignant mm. is is more of the serious stuff about me, serious topics about me, but also what I saw around me growing up. Yeah, well, I certainly think watching some of your music videos but and also listening to some of your tracks that um, sometimes the rap is a surprise. So, mm. yeah. you, you know, I, I know that's like maybe yeah. came to you first in the playground. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Like rap was maybe your entry, but... Yeah. But there's a lot of singing, you know, there's a lot of yeah. like yeah. a folky, mm. but modern vibe. Um, I love the uh, instrumentals. So, yeah. you know, you're using percussive guitar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 and, you know, it's clever. Oh, it's thanks, it's intellectual. It's complex. Um, yeah, I could call it serious, but, you know, uh, the better words for me would be moving, challenging, informative um uh, you know and something that i think you do that's really brave is you talk about things that are real to you and mm. you know i i think we'll talk about you know you went on the voice uk and mm. it'd be really interesting to talk about yeah. that but you mentioned about your dad first and i know mm. the song you played on that was Rest like an sense. open letter to your dad right so yeah. let's talk about uh, a little bit about your dad and you, mm. you know you said he died when you were quite young, yeah. you know, how did that happen? And mm. Yeah, he, um, so he passed away when I was 16 um, and he, he had cancer. So I was, it was a bit of a cold turkey scenario. I was kind of out with friends at the time, that age doing things I probably shouldn't have done. Um, and it kind of hit me like a ton of bricks. He had cancer and they thought, it, it may sound crazy. And I think anyone who's experienced this so young would maybe relate but you don't always get all the information at the time. Like, I know it sounds crazy, but I still don't know and have never asked what type of cancer it is. Right. So I know, like, friends who have had cancer and, like, of, like distant family members and relatives that have, and I know everything about their cancer. Um, but for my dad, he died within the space of three months wow. or so. So maybe even shorter time period than that. And I apologise to my mum if I'm getting this wrong at all, but it's like... Yeah, we love you, mum. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, like, I couldn't... I couldn't almost... I was within it. I was completely within it, and... um the information almost went over my head, but it happened so quick that I was suddenly having to prepare kind of a poem for his, his funeral. And I was like, I'm an only child. And yeah, it, it was tough. It was really tough, man. And um, so Restlessness is really an open letter that I was writing um, when he first passed. That's what's interesting. Because I, I released it when I went on The Voice as the song. But so, so had had you written it? Elements of it. Before he... Before I could really play I could play chords in that before I could really play the guitar like I can now and also before I could really sing like right. I can now so I wrote the rap parts um at least half of them and I haven't really said this in an interview before even on the voice but I wrote that pretty much after he died straight away wow. so it was like the first thing that I wrote um and then all these years later when I went on the voice and I was like listen I really want to do this song about my dad I think it's important to me I've you know I feel like this is almost a I've used this word quite a lot, but a culminating moment where I'm, I'm on the stage. I feel like I've getting a bit of exposure now and I feel like it has to be something about me. And I played a few songs to them and this is one of the ones that they really resonated with. And, and then I re kind of wrote bits of it. So it was a bit more grown up, let's say, had a bit more of a flow to it that I have now. Um, I'm, I'm into the technical part of rap a lot. Like a lot of the rappers I listen to are very technical in terms of metaphors and rhythm and flow and cadence. That's really important to me. So I kind of, embedded it within the percussive guitar that I used, put some vocals on the top um, with a big belt at the end and and yeah, <laughs> did it in that in that space really. But um, mate, it's, yeah, it's always been really important. It was called My Father until when I went on The Voice and kind of changed it slightly. But but yeah, yeah, it was a really difficult well, time. Why did you change it? I, I changed it because I had I had another song which was the, the melody for Restlessness and I thought, and I played around with a few tunes that I could put it on. Um, that weren't kind of on electric, it was on acoustic, I could do a bit of percussion. The whole point of going on a show like that is you wanna really demonstrate everything that you can do. Your strengths in that, you only get a minute and a half, mate. So you wanna basically portray every single gift musically yeah. that you have. I can play guitar, I can rap, <laughs> I can do percussive guitar. You kind of need sing. to, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, it, I know how it sounds, but it's like you, you, you almost need to and the producers are saying, please do that. So I think when I played, I remember I played about five to 10 songs with them. It's a very long process. Right. So um, we'll go on the, pro I don't know if you want to delve into it now at all. 
Um, you, you can talk about whatever you want. If, I know you were quite interested in this before the, before we started this. Well, I'm interested um, in the process, but course, I, I, yeah, I'm yeah. also keen to like give some space for your dad and honour him as well. Course, you know, yeah, yeah. You know, and we might just have glanced across it, but mm. I'm interested in like you know. Who was your dad to you? How did he influence yeah. your life? You said he was this. Uh, it sounds like an amazing, like prophetic artist. Yeah. Like, like let, let's spend a bit of time just honouring, you know, your mum and dad and like their influence in your life because yeah. you know we talked a bit about the not so good stuff. Mm. So let's talk about Should have really the good stuff. That, yeah, no, no, it's all good. It's all yeah, good, yeah. And, and you know, like the we we get to where we get to, but yeah, yeah let, let, let's talk about dad for a bit. And yeah, so my my dad was. A larger than life character, really. He was kind of, he was always, um, he lit up a crowded room, I would say. Um, maybe not always the loudest in the room all the time, but he had a presence about him. He would speak to the butcher about God. I remember coming back from football, he was, he was a pure evangelist. I used to call him almost John the Baptist at times. He used to have this uh, beautiful but crazy kind of curly hair until he was like, they had me really late. So they, uh, my mum and my dad waited 18 years for me and they've, they call me Miracle Baby and I won't go into that. That's my well, mum's thing to say. There's a lot of pressure but, there, isn't there? Yeah, yeah I know. So, <laughs> so they were slightly older. So um, yeah, it, it was it was, it was was kind of brilliant growing up with their maturity as mature Christians, et cetera. But yeah, my, my, my dad was a, a strong believer and he was a steadfast evangelist Christian who would tell anyone about the gospel. Like literally, as I've said, within the butchers on the way back from football, within a room full of like executives in like some posh place in Birmingham, in the city of Birmingham, or his work place, which he was a, he was a printer by trade, but then became a, a carer of very working class profession. So um, was very empathetic, very compassionate, always cared for people. And I think that's why he ended up becoming a carer, um, but was a printer until that kind of went to the wayside as a lot of towns have, whether it was in the North with a lot of the mines or whatever it was, printing was a big thing in Birmingham and it suddenly got outlawed by, you know, Technology, basically. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, he, he was he was a brilliant man, a steadfast Christian, and um, was what genuinely wonderful, genuinely wonderful in every way. Um, would make anyone laugh and speak to anyone on the street. Speak to and this is where I think I maybe get this part from. But whether it was a homeless man or, as I've said, executive, it doesn't matter. He would speak to everyone exactly the same. And I think that's the biggest thing I've got off him is that he was there for anyone. Um, he mentored a lot of people with addiction, um, as I said, he was a carer, but within his church life, he was a prominent figure in church and was always on leadership teams, ran a Christian art group that was called Living Stones in the Jewelry Quarter in Birmingham that had like 20 members, all from different parts of Birmingham, all Christians doing quite secular work sometimes. Um, but his work was brilliant. I mean, he he basically painted these like 10 feet canvases with with pictures of dreams and visions that he had of Jesus and, and heaven and, and the rest of it. and. And my mom, um, absolutely wonderful. She's still with us, and she's the most, she's the most kind-hearted, um, wonderful, generous, um, thoroughly lovely woman that you'll ever meet. Genuinely, um, kind of working-class Birmingham accent. Uh, <laughs> you, 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 you know, you, you know when your dinner's ready. Dinner's ready. She you sounds know, amazing. Yeah, yeah she's I have family amazing. in Cannock, so I know exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so thick, thick Brummie accent, which sounds maybe slightly black country at times, which she won't like. She wants to get rid of her accent. She hates her accent. No, um, no. she's. But I, I love it. I, I think this is this is you, you know. But yeah, she's still with us, and and she, without going into it too much, she went, she went through how, when my dad passed, like genuinely. Um, they were so close. Um, they did everything together. And they, before they had me, they were together 20 years or so. Um, again, sorry, mommy, if I'm getting the, hist the timeline wrong, but genuinely it was the biggest thing for her. So at the time I was like, listen, a few years later, we need to move out of Birmingham. Um, I love Erdington. I know I've said a lot of bad things about it, but that was more what I got involved in. Mm. My family live there and I'll always rep for it. Like I hope to go back one day in some capacity and actually help out the community. Um, I'm doing that here in Devon, but but yeah, so a few years later, I, I basically said, listen, we need to move out. Um, we always went to holiday here, went to Creation Fest, went to Woolacombe, did a bit of surfing growing up. That's how I got into surfing. I was like, we need to move. Um, so when I was uh, knocking on my 20th birthday, I did a bit of traveling before, worked at a factory and that's a separate thing, but moved to Devon and that's when I ended up in Exmouth. Um, where I am now. So kind of connecting with a lot of the guys, Noah, who's one of the producers for this show, um, ended up becoming my producer. And yeah, so have a world down here now. Yeah. You well, know, but you know, it sounds weird as a northerner to say welcome to Devon, but you know, welcome mate, yeah. to Devon. Speaking to a brummie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it is an awesome place. And 
you, you know, I have a similar story of ending up in Plymouth, you, you know, but, you know, I think, like, you've met Noah, our producer, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. repping Noah. Noah Gilbert, brilliant. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. We're, we're always repping Noah, and the other lads on in the podcast, we've got Dimitri and Rich today, so thanks, guys, for mm. producing and doing the sound and everything. Um, so, Benjamin, let's talk about the voice. Let's, yeah, yeah. let's talk about like what that experience is like is like mm. you know we we do christian media yeah, so we we make daily tv shows we edit other people's shows we um are always coming up with creative ideas for new you know like formats and things yeah. like that um and here you are on a very secular but very very popular show showcasing this gift that god's giving you like uh, how did it come about you know yeah. So I, I released music for about independently. So I was in a band in Birmingham. Um, I went to college and this is where the split between football and called? music. Self-titled Benjamin Haycock band for a bit because I was writing the songs, oh. but it ended up becoming... Humble. <laughs> yeah, I know, mate. I know. It was, it was, we put, I didn't actually create. I'm I know, joking. I know, I know. I know. <laughs> but it, in the end, we were a very diverse group. So we, we come up with this uh, really strange name. So I forget it, something like racial indifference or something to basically let everyone know that listen we're very multicultural and we don't care right. <laughs> so right. it, it was almost funny to us when um because like, you had to point it out in the name right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um so that ended up but we ended up just going so it was benjamin the whole idea was it was me as an artist um but I had my best mate at the time who was dan mcneil who um is guitarist and uh, works for chroma church birmingham so north formerly north birmingham vineyard um so they're quite a popular church in birmingham now but my uh, few people in college at the time. So we basically, up to then I was a solo artist, joined this college band. We got signed basically on this two year deal. We won a competition to get that sign in. We performed at the O2. We did quite a lot within Birmingham, performed oh, yeah, at the amazing. Drum, the Institute. We did a lot. I remember the World Cup final in 2014, which I'm a big football fan. Regrettably missed it, <laughs> but we're performing at, was performing at O2. So it was like the biggest gig I had uh, until then. And it was, yeah, it was buzzing with it. But um. So that kind of petered out, and that's a story within itself that I won't go we into. We won in 2014. Uh, Argentina lost and Germany won. Oh, there you go. I came back for the penalty. Football fan. So I'm a big Messi fan, um, uh, and I know Noah's a Ronaldo fan. So we <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so I wanted Argentina to win and we lost, I remember that. But, uh, but yeah, so it was this thing where we were doing pretty well, if I'm honest. There were seven of us. And we had like a jazz guitarist, a brilliant singer, which was Dan's sister, Becky, who does, she's an amazing worship leader now. So they were Christian. Um, we had a gospel um, kind of bass drummer and bassist, which would just like change keys in the middle of the song and telepathically know when they were doing it. Just incredible musicianship, which I didn't even have at the time. I was just a songwriter, rapper and singer, really. Um, played a bit of guitar as well. And then we had uh, a few other people in the band and it ended up becoming this thing where we did events with like seven, eight people on stage. So it was this thing where it was like my songs and we were, we were doing my songs to suddenly there being like eight band members with different instruments. Right. But with that comes politics and with right. that comes people turning up like five hours late to rehearsals and not turning up to the studio to record. And and there was a lot of pressure because we were still doing college work at the time and, you know, and all of that sort of stuff. So, and there was a few divisions within the band and it kind of perpetuated a bit of bad blood between various people. And unfortunately it kind of disintegrated, it petered out. Um, and we didn't actually re ended up recording. We didn't end actually end up recording any songs. For the, it sounds bad. We had this deal that required us to, I think, record two songs. We didn't. We got like half a track done. Right. And we didn't end up finishing it because of all the politics. So right. it's just bands. Anyone who's been in a band can testify to this. It just happens. Um, so I then we moved to Devon, and I started playing guitar a lot more. Up to then, I had a few years of, of really learning in that phase of sitting in kind of my fingers bleeding at times, being so into it, kind of playing like three or four chords to suddenly becoming this musician, buying like a, a big investment at the time was a Maiton guitar, which is an Australia based company that does incredibly handcrafted guitars. Tommy Emmanuel, John Butler, all these incredible influences of mine played it. I'm now an, a Maiton artist on their website alongside these guys, which is just unbelievably, uh, it's just unbelievable. But at the time, that was like a big investment. I was like, I'm doing this seriously. And then I ended up releasing an EP. Off the back of that, um, Fender approached me, um, biggest guitar company in the world, that, and they had this undiscovered thing within London that they were doing in Soho. And they were like, listen, we've listened to your track. Um, Fire guide me home at the time and we love it, come on. So I came onto that, I did an episode or two, which to be honest was relatively similar 
to some of the voice aspects. Um, and then off the back of that, got a bit of got a bit of a following, um, small following, but a bit of a, a cult following amongst the thou- a couple of thousand that listened to me. Became quite a prolific YouTuber as well. Did a lot of YouTube videos and music videos and stuff like that. And um, the voice contacted me basically off the back of all of that. And we're like, listen, we've listened to your music. We love it. Please, can you come on the show and do one of your songs? Um, so that's how they contacted me initially. Off the back of that was like, a, and many people don't realize this, a process of maybe six six months or so. This is during the pandemic that it kind of overflowed with where um, I had to travel to London wearing a mask, anti-back in every station. It was like that. Um, we had like zones in every studio. So you don't realize you don't actually have one audition. You have maybe like four or five, even though they've asked you to be on the show. Yeah. You, you still have to go through like Zoom auditions and go on the show before and go to London, go to Manchester. And in the end, it culminated in me doing a blind audition, doing the song Restlessness, um, a minute and a half piece. So, so <clears throat> it's a not so blind audition. It's not blind so for blind the, for the four judges, but. But for the producers, no, because they know Absolutely everything know about what you. Getting, right? Oh, and until then, you've already like a month before. The, a lot of this is NDA, so I can't. Oh yeah, it's fine. It's I can't. Fine. It's non-disclosure, say, so I can't say, yeah. say what you can. You know. Um, but you kind of do interviews, and they come to my house before and um, filmed around Exmouth and the beach and Sandy Bay area, and, and done like about an hour interview with me, which they use probably about two minutes, maybe yeah, even yeah, that. Yeah. Um, as you know, you know they cut up and so. And this is what's good about this because you know none of it's going to get cut up. So. Well, it's the point of this. I can't really edit anything. Yeah. You know. <laughs> We, we get what we get. Yeah, exactly, mate, exactly. So, um, yeah, so it, it ended up being this thing where, you know, after six months' worth of things, I made it to the final stage, of, which for many people is the beginning of it. <laughs> um, but I think that's why the standard's decent. It is it is high, if I'm honest. I mean, some of the people that I was with, and I'm sure a lot of people on The Voice can testament to this, like, extremely good. Yeah. Better singers than me who are in that room. Um, my thing was I was a songwriter. I yeah. played guitar in an interesting way, I rapped, I sung, and that's, I think, why um, I made it as far as I did in terms of that. But the singing quality is just opera singers who would blow your mind listening to them. Right. Just like rehearsing in the background as you're waiting. So that was a bit of a crazy experience. Being It was very kind of intimidating at times, you know, but, but ended up creating this like one minute and a half version of Restlessness, which I ended up playing. Um, and if you want to lead into that at all, or you just want me to say it, but <laughs> you carry on. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's it's entertaining. I mean, I'm really interested in. Um, so you've gone through this whole process, mm. interviewed a bunch of times. Like, what about your faith? Like, you know, yeah. were you asked about that? Did you talk about that? Because mm. I've watched your interview. I've watched how they've edited it together. Yeah. Um, and I can say this because I'm not under an NDA. <laughs> I, it looks like to me they're looking for a story. Yeah. So, you know, they majored on you, Dad, mm. which is fine yeah. if you're fine with it, you know, obviously. Um, and, you know, they, they majored on the fact that you, you, you know, I mean, you've got something unique. God has given mm. you something unique. The way you put all the genres together and, you know, it's I'm pumped to hear you keep refining it because, you mm. know, like it's only getting better and better and better. Okay. Um, but, like, you know, what what, you know, how did your faith, like, how was your faith either included or excluded in that process? And yeah, did you talk about it? If you didn't, why not, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's a good question. So I ended up having this interview, which is about an hour or so, as I said. Um, I mentioned about my faith a couple of times. I mentioned about a couple of things in the past that I've mentioned to you. Right. Most, if not all, got edited out. Um, a bit of back, so I said a bit earlier, I'm not actually sure whether it was before camera or within the interview, because right. it's very much fluid between me and you, this conversation has been, so yeah, excuse yeah. me if I've said yeah. it. Yeah, for everyone at home, we had a big chat before we yeah, started, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and Benjamin's just trying to remember what he said off and on camera. Yeah, really. but um, yeah, I, I basically gave them five of my, they were really interested in one of my songs, so I was the only person that year to do one of my own songs, basically. Yeah. Um, so I was extremely lucky for that, if I'm honest with you, and that came with a bunch of contractual things that, on in a long time because right. that's boring yeah <laughs> but there well, is like stuff NDA like well. that you it's, that yeah. you own your own tracks and stuff yeah stuff yeah. It, yeah and if i get past a certain stage they would kind of sony who was that was kind of the prize for winning right. the rest of it but without going into too much about that i gave them maybe five or ten songs of mine that i could do they picked restlessness out of all of them i kind of refined it and and they kind of gone with that and then they asked me a lot about my dad and the rest of it and about the song of course of course um and, it, and I'm glad they did. As much as I'm saying, like, they cut out a bunch of stuff and stuff about my faith and my childhood, you know, fortunately for me that 
a lot of people who, especially in the pandemic, couldn't see their dads. A lot of parents died during the pandemic. It was a really difficult time when mm. it got broadcast. Mm. And honestly, mate, out of the tens of thousands of messages you do get when you go on this one of these shows and you're relatively successful, I reckon about a thousand, if not more, was about the dad and people awesome. just like, awesome. I've been through this. I had one guy from Indonesia was like, his dad just died and was like, I was on his deathbed and I listened to your song after and it just awesome. helped me get through that process. Um, I had people like suicidal and they've just been like, I couldn't hack it. I haven't got any parents anymore. Um, there's one chap from uh, Newcastle, I think it was, and his mum died and his dad just died as well. I was just like, your song has helped me get through it. Your music's helped me get through it. And so I'm glad they did because that was an open portal into my music, which is a lot more, uh, there's a lot more social issues, a lot more about me within it. But I think it kind of opened that. And I was very honest about everything. Yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't kind of... Um, get them to include anything or not include anything no whatever. let's be clear you know we thank god for them if they're good yeah yeah yeah. you know it was positive it was very yeah, positive exactly. you know, like, if you're gonna put if they're gonna put you on and they're gonna yeah. influence you know if you get to a place where you've got influence there mm. will be a point where you can say and do what you want you know yeah. what happens in with every artist yeah. and you know maybe you're heading there now yeah. and, it's so, important for me to know just before you if you don't mind no please do you get a list of songs that they send you and I never really wanted to do, because I, I see myself as not the best singer in the world, but more of a storyteller through my songs. So that was a, a big thing for me. I was like, the caveat to all of this is I'm not going to go on the show unless I did my own song. Right. So that's when, okay, we'll listen to five or 10 and then that comes in. I think for, for a lot of artists who go on, they kind of get given songs. Yeah. Um, so I was very lucky within that. And I think that was probably God as well, if I'm honest. I think it was God. You didn't have to, because well, it'd know. be a weird reflection, wouldn't it, if you kind of got made to sing songs you didn't want to sing when you were younger i don't enjoy it yeah, yeah and then now you're gonna to have to do it again i'm not a great cover artist like i've got friends and gigs i've been to recently and they're just incredible yeah as cover artists my best mate george um he's the worship leader for chrome of church vineyard george griffiths he's an he knows every song Beatles songs you know ub40 uh, guns and roses he can just play i'm not great at covering other people's stuff if i'm honest um it's all been about my song. So I was so blessed to be able to do my own song, genuinely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think so. And and I think that story of being able to minister to people through your music, mm. I, I, I mean, you know, even if you weren't explicit in it, you know, it was having, it was healing people and it was helping yeah. people. Um, so I just want to read a few of the things that the, the judges said. Oh, here we go. Because <laughs> I, I think it's awesome, right? So Will I Am said uh, that you're the real deal. And, uh, Anne Marie said that you you had a flow that she hadn't seen before, which I, I completely agree with. I mean, everybody at home, you've you've got to listen to Benjamin's music. It's 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 unique and it is it's storytelling. It, it you have to listen to it a few times as well because they're complex to really catch the lyrics and to, you know to get the heart of it. It's so good. And then uh, Tom John said that you'd taken it to another level. And then Ollie Murray said he only wants you to sing your own songs. I'm like, well, if I take all them, maybe that's a worship song in there or something. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. You know, I, it, you just did so great. And, you know, uh, I think you represented yourself really well. And, you, you know, congratulations for getting as far as you did, really. Thanks, mate. Um, the question is, is um, like, what now, what next? Mm. You know, like... Um, I've never, I've never seen a worship song, or mm. do you do worship songs? You know, like what? Yeah. Where, where do you, where are you going next with your music? So it's, it's a really interesting one, and I think, to be honest, in terms of my faith, this has been the most interesting point that I'll probably go into make. I, so it's been about a year, maybe a year and a half since the Voice was broadcast. I genuinely, until then, never released a Christian song. Everything I put out at the time, which I worked very hard to put out, and. There's no real Christian influence within it. There are, put. I've got a song called Brother where I mention Jesus, I mention um, faith, I mention the Lord. I do in all fairness, so maybe that's something. But some of the, like I got many opportunities after and, and have done the last few years and, you know, I've done kind of sofa sound, sold out shows throughout the UK and done big events and festivals and things, but, and got a publishing deal, which I'm signed to now. So a lot of good kind of secular things have happened, but some of the most interesting, unique, brilliant opportunities that I've got have been people reaching out to me, Christian organizations or churches. Um, are you a Christian? Is the first question. And I'm like, yeah, how do you know that? And they go, <laughs> we sense something within your music that makes us think you're Christian. This is what we're doing. How can we incorporate you? 
So it's the most fascinating thing to me and it's it's the most Jesus led thing to me because I've been like, Lord, I don't know which opportunities to take after this. I turned down a lot of big opportunities as well. I turned down a record deal because I didn't think it was right. I turned down a lot of other, for me, huge opportunities if I'm being quite frank. The ones that I took were either ones that I thought would be aligned to what I'm doing, my vision, but also most of the Christian ones. I've, you know, I got, there's this church in Plymouth called Redeemer Church and I did a sold out show there in Plymouth that, that they were doing this alpha course and they were like, are you a Christian? <laughs> I was like, yeah. yes. Yeah. So I, I did this like opening night of this alpha course that drew in a lot of people within the community in Plymouth. This is the reason why I'm saying that within Plymouth, they're just like people to see me at the time who ended up signing up to this alpha course. Oh, yeah, class. I had Creation Fest who I'd been going to, to years for and with Noah producing for, uh, with Noah, he, he led me on to do, I've done Creation Fest for two years and I'm doing a third year on the main stage and it's like, I grew up going to that as a kid and the Extreme Tours has been the most recent endeavor um, so they, they're a, an international organization. Hopefully you don't mind me going into this. No, please do. Based in Nashville, a guy called Ted Brune founded it. Uh, Ted Brune uh, founded it. And they go to disadvantaged communities throughout the world, started in the US in places like Compton, you know, basically areas in the US that you wouldn't get many ministry teams going out to. They go there, they create stuff within the community. So they don't like, you know, organize a venue or hire a venue with a thousand capacity and invite people in. They go within the skate park or the park, which is really dodgy. they have been like a, you know, a, a, someone being shot in the past kind of week or so. They go into skate parks and create skate competitions. They have a crew of team, which are all volunteers who just set up a stage, the most professional stage, festival like stage with all these professional sound engineers and the rest of it within the communities that just wouldn't have any of this access. And they minister to them and they get secular and non-secular artists to perform and then just speak to them after about God, yeah, speak to them about Jesus, get them to tell the story. It's very fluid. It's not forced in any way. Um, so they contacted me and was just like, we kind of feel like you're a Christian. Again, was just like, okay, brilliant. <laughs> Um, invited me to Stoke on Trent, which is not not far from your neck of the woods, kind of in between. And um, well, we disagree massively on that. But oh, really? <laughs> would you would you class Stoke as the North or Midlands? No, no, I'd still probably class it the Midlands. Yeah, but probably. you know, there'll be someone out there that will disagree with me. <laughs> you know, maybe put it in the comments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I ended up going to Stoke on Trent and performing at the Objective, which is their kind of showcase before they do the tour. So they went to a bunch of UK cities. Yeah, and it was the first one since the pandemic that they restarted, and they went to you know, deprived communities within Birmingham, Liverpool, Manchester, Swansea, all throughout the UK. I did a performance for them and spoke to a lot of the people, industry professionals, the former guitarist from Skillet was there, Dennis O'Neill, who runs one of the biggest um, chart, Christian charts in, in the UK. Um, so a lot of kind of influential people from the industry, Christian mostly, but some non-Christians alike, but most of the bands weren't Christian. Right. <laughs> and, they, and they went off it and signed up for this tour off their own accord of Ted basically saying that, listen, this is a Christian thing. We're doing this for God. We're doing yeah, this, this for is, Jesus. This is an evangelistic thing. This is an evangelistic yeah. thing. We've got you because of your talents, but we want to utilize your talents for something more than a career, for something more than getting the hits or numbers yeah. or making money off it or signing a record label. Like It's really difficult to, for musicians to traverse the industry, particularly if you're Christian, but even if you're not, to get a place within the world. You're struggling, you're grinding for a long time with no results. Yeah. And I've, I've been through that. But before The Voice, I was doing it for five or six years, as I said, with a band and on my own. And it's it's difficult to break through. And Ted's like, listen, man, you don't have to wait until you've broke through. You don't have to wait until there's got this glimmer, you know, this glamorous music deal. You can actually do something genuinely yeah, worthwhile. Get, get into the communities. Get in the communities. Utilize your own music for a higher purpose, for something that you're, you're, you're affecting lives tangibly. Because they don't relate to necessarily this glitzy... Bethel like thing they just don't being honest what they relate to is just this skater who is like has been through you know there's addicts there Ted mm. Brun's story is incredible like I won't go into it but he was suicidal and he's caught off the back of it and these are real stories from people who are broken speaking to broken people honestly saying this is how we've got out of it through our faith Maybe we need Ted on the podcast. Honestly, mate, he, he would be an incredible one. I did um, uh, an award show with Dennis O'Neill and performed there. And we did an interview, I think, with one of the other stations. And and we went into a bit of it. It's an, it's an incredible thing. He's got an incredible testimony. But 
yeah, basically it's culminated in now him asking me um, and my wife. I haven't spoke about my wife. I'm married, uh, Brooke. She's a youth and families worker in Exmouth. Um, Lighthouse Youth Ministries we run, and we run two youth groups a week um, for 11 to 16-year-olds, different youth group. We're actually in one of the more deprived areas within Exmouth. Um, and he wants to, Ted Brune, actually um, create a few events in the summer. So he's recently... He travelled from like Glasgow to Exmouth, which those of you who are not from the UK won't appreciate how long that actually it's is. It's about as far as you can go. Mate, if you're listening it's... from America, you know you you drive for fun, but you know it, it's it's a it's a trip. I could have met him anywhere. He comes all the way Bless to him. be in the community and yeah. see some of these areas. And you know what? I showed him some of the better areas in Exmouth and he was like, actually, let's go to the council estate where we do the youth groups. Let's go in the park and just create something. So we're doing a really exciting project with them this summer um, that I'm kind of co-coordinating with my wife alongside Ted, performing as well, but also getting local musicians to perform and create a skate competition uh, with some of the local skaters here also. On the verge of Christianity, a few of them are Christians and they grew up with Christianity, but they're really influential within their own skate park within the community. So it's like a bottom up approach, Um, but just amazing things. So to kind of round up to what your first question was about on this, a lot of the opportunities I've got posted, still creating secular music. I've wrote a lot of Christian music that I hope to release with, with certain people in the industry that I've, I've been writing with um, has been secular and yet I've got all of this christian opportunity which has just been it blows my mind how it's come about if i'm really honest with you yeah it's it's something that really i mean a lot of my songs are social issues about homelessness one of my recent songs that i did with noah homeless winters force for nature is about the environment yeah, i love nature. Great, by the way thanks mate um and the recent one was about uh, people's war which is about the war in ukraine um so i do a lot of stuff about social issues um other than my own story um, a lot of it's social commentary. So I guess it feeds into it within that. But it's just incredible how God works through these things. It's like, it blows my mind. Yeah. Honestly. I, I think we've answered the question once and for all. Mm. Like, are you a Christian? Absolutely. <laughs> Resoundingly, yes. Um, and, and what's amazing is, I just love to hear how God is, even though you're not pitching yourself as mm. an evangelist or as a Christian artist, or mm. that actually not only would he, would God place the opportunity to use your music to evangelize and to give people hope, mm. but that also you're taking them. Yeah. Um, have you ever considered like the consequence of that? Have you ever, have you ever had mm. the consequence of that? Like, you know, I guess I've heard people say that, um, yeah, it's all right to have a faith mm. and to thank God when you get an award, but you know, Keep I haven't got any awards yet. Yeah. <laughs> well, not yet. Yeah. Um, Maybe that's prophetic. <laughs> I hope so. no, in, all, in all seriousness, mate, it's a great question. Um, I think I think it's difficult. I think, um, you know, you, you kind of straddle the line sometimes. Um, so a lot of these Christian events, I'm, I'm doing secular songs, also about my dad, about social issues. I don't do a song which is like a, a love song, for instance. All of it's about serious stuff, but... And it feeds in and then between I do kind of Q and A's. So a lot of the extreme tour stuff between songs, I'm evangelizing to them, um, which is Christian. And a lot of the stuff I've done recently is um, a creation fest is exactly the same. Like I pray and, you know, does what any other kind of CCM artist would do between songs. I do. I just then go into a song about my dad or a song about homelessness instead of. So I've, I feel like people may disagree with this. I feel really like that God's put me in and a few other artists who are doing quite similar things in a space where it's actually the perfect environment to evangelize. Whereas like, I'm broken. I'm not the finished article yet. I haven't got it figured out. I still find it difficult to make sense of the world at times. Um, I struggle with all these issues. I'm a firm advocate of um, the environment, um, being uh, more pristine and protecting the environment, about homelessness, about social issues about um, youth deprivation and issues like that. And if I can come out of that as a Christian and come into it as a Christian, more importantly, um, and have people know my faith, I think that's important. I think that's the question you're asking is, is it important to demonstrate this more? And yes, and this is why I'm doing this and a few other things is that I want to put out there that I am a Christian and that I want to, I want to, I want to do Christian music as well. It definitely is something that I've written loads of Christian music throughout the years. I'd love to release. I just haven't got the opportunity yet. Um, But yeah, it's, it's a, it's a difficult 
line to walk sometimes. But I would say, slightly controversially perhaps, that maybe some CCM, Christian Contemporary Music, you know, it's it's done all the time and it's kind of this thing where people are used to it. And it's almost breaking down the barriers sometimes of that. It's a bit more raw, less script, less less professional maybe at times in terms of the performances, less polished, less we're going to go there, we're not going to go there. And actually an artist who um, just comes and says it like it is, talks about the world, talks about his own issues, and, and at the end of it actually says, yeah, God help me through a lot of this. And I think that's when it's that's why it's important now for me to actually do a lot more Christian stuff because I don't want to stray too far away from that. Um, you know, and I also, it's like, you know, some of the biggest artists in the world or the UK, they're Christians and yeah, you would never know about it until they get an award and then are like, I'm Christian. I don't want to exactly. wait till then. Yeah. I don't want to wait till then because hopefully through my music, there's a thread of Jesus. That's what I really hope is the, the biggest take is I've been through all of this. These are all the issues that I care about, but ultimately Jesus is the person who uh, is getting me through this and God is, is, is instrumental to all of it. Excuse the pun. No, it's it, it, it's amazing. So let, let's talk about some of some of the songs quickly because you've mentioned to the one about the Ukraine war and the one about homelessness. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, it, if I advise, if you're listening, you should go and listen to those. You can see them on Benjamin's YouTube page, Spotify, or, yeah, or yeah. Spotify, or all of the good platforms. Um, some of the not so good platforms, probably too. Yeah. <laughs> Won't say any of them. No, no. <laughs> but you know, go go check. Benjamin's songs out because we're, we're not got time to play them here but you should definitely go listen to them but you you know my question is is like you know you're talking about social issues but why mm. like, what are you trying to say what are you hoping you know happens from that creative you know output mm. so I think there's two things to this is like if you're someone like Ed Sheeran or someone with a huge audience then you obviously have influence to really change social issues. Yeah. So I always, when people are say, I don't like musicians, when it's political, it's maybe slightly different when it's like too left or right and it's like to straggle the Brexit lines, for instance, and things like that. It's like, these, these are social issues that we all care about. Right. Homelessness. Yeah, we all agree that- All agree that these are things- Homelessness is bad. Exactly, yeah. exactly. We all agree that hopefully that the nature should be protected, maybe not agree with all the rhetoric, but we, we wanna make sure our beaches are clean and the rest of it. Um, the, the war, whether it's whether you're on one side or the other of various wars, conflict happens, there's victims, there's people that, the song's called Pupil's War. We wish people weren't dying in we war. We wish people weren't dying or All being persecuted. People. Exactly. So it's not political necessarily, but why I'm doing it is, honestly, mate, I'm just influenced by it. I, I, I don't sit out and go, these are all the issues and these are the ones I'm going to speak about. There's only one commission that I've got and that's off this environmental charity. All the rest are organic. Yeah. I read the homelessness, homeless winters when I spoke to a homeless man. And I got quite friendly with him over a coffee. My mum works, volunteers for Open Doors, which is a homeless charity in Exmouth. Brilliant charity. They do amazing work. And he just influenced me. A guy called Alex. And we were speaking uh, for maybe an hour one day over a coffee and I've written the song straight after. Yeah. So, but these are the songs which stick with me. It's not the songs I write about you know, about, uh, I love my wife, but it's not really, I've got a few songs about my wife, but it's not necessarily those songs which stick with me. And I've got so many songs at the back burner that I have to kind of choose when I enter the studio, when I go to Noah's studio, it's like, I have to now choose which song to record and put on an EP or an album. Right. And I tend to always gravitate to the ones about social issues or about myself, which are, cause I feel like people will resonate. I feel like people will um, connect with them, will engage with them, but ultimately it, I'm more passionate about them. I just am. I don't want to be there singing in front of people almost aimlessly. I'm not in the business to do that. Um, well, after The Voice, I got like a bunch of wedding opportunities and I did a few all over the... You do, yeah, don't yeah, you? Yeah, I mean, you've got to make your money. And, it, and it's a lot of money that you get off it when you've been on The Voice or something. Um, I shouldn't really say that, but there you go. There's a, If anyone wants to go on The Voice, do it. Like You, you do get a lot of money and it's it just didn't interest me singing covers and the rest of it. Um, and even my own songs that were slightly more kind of PG <laughs> a lot of the time and... Um, there's no swearing in my songs or anything, but they're about serious issues. The war, when I'm talking about, um, I'm talking about bodies lying in the streets of Ukraine. Yeah, they're and tough. They're tough. They're tough, tough, tough songs. Too, yeah. yeah. And 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 you've, you've I, I, I'm grappling with them as I'm doing it. I'm saying I'm. This is, I'm not a politician. I'm not someone who would like to be um, within that world necessarily. I'm just someone who is looking at the world almost like the, the greats of the past in folk music that have influenced me, like Bob Dylan, etc. But more contemporary examples being a Carla and just speaking about issues 
from a first person point of view being like, this is how I see them. Mm. I'm not saying you should do this, you should do that. Absolutely not. Um, hopefully there's nothing that preachy within my music. I really do try and not make it so. It's just like, these are the issues. This is what I'm seeing. The Homeless Winters one, the thread of the music video, which we did with a really um, uh, notable uh, director called uh, John Piers, who has recently um, uh, was one of the cameraman directors of a film that's coming out with Gerard Butler, which he listened to my music in Saudi Arabia and then wanted to shoot a video for me. It was just like, okay. And he came all the way to Devon and we'd done the video for Homeless Winters and People's War, um, which was amazing. And those videos hopefully will portray that it's about the people that I'm writing about and then it's not really about me. Yeah. And I think that's the, the thing. I'm talking a lot about myself because you're asking me, but I don't tend to much. Well, you're on a podcast, so if you, you don't talk, to. if you we talked to. about me, it'd be a very short and boring podcast. Oh, 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 no, 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 it wouldn't, <laughs> firstly. But secondly, we did have a chat before. We did. I asked you loads no, of no, questions. No, 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 I don't want any questions. But, <laughs> but you, you know, maybe that's another day, a yeah, podcast. Absolutely. A young podcast. But, you, you know, I do I do like that you're posing, you're posing a question and you're highlighting social issues, and, it, and I do get that sense that you're not trying to give answers, you know. Absolutely, I haven't got the answers, mate. No, 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 no. Very no, few no. of us have, even politicians. Right. That's the problem They're just a lot doing the best time. they can, I think. <laughs> yeah. I think, you know, Absolutely, mate, yeah. you, you know if, you, if you watch, like, the stuff on YouTube and yeah. they're too far right, they're too far left, and everything's Artisan polarised, is, yeah. isn't yeah. it? So polarised. And I'm like, what if these are just people doing the best they can without you know, the answers, like, how do you really solve a pandemic, you know? Like, I think a lot of the time, a lot, maybe not all politicians. But I mean, I think we do have the answer, but... Yeah, ex exactly. And I think apart from that, but going on the political thing, I think a lot of people within that world do go in it for the right reasons initially, like right. when they're really like, younger, they aren't they? They must like, do, they must do. But then it's almost, obviously, money gets in the way and opportunities, but also political affiliations get in the way that they have to stick with one side. Right. Honestly, if you're not slightly nuanced, I think you probably need to look more at the other side as well. Yeah. You have to be kind of nuanced because, you know, there's, there's not a right and wrong answer to everything yeah. unless it's about Christ, unless it's about Christianity. And that's where the thread of, I believe, a lot of the politics come. Well, even Jesus gets used. And, you know, Absolutely. what we encourage you here at God TV is, you know, we have a plethora of programs mm. that I think some might disagree with other programs, yeah. you know, and not everybody, I, I've not met anybody, in fact, that likes all of the programming mm. on God TV, but, you know, God speaks to people in different ways, there's different flavours, you know, different uh, ideas, and you've just got to have your own discernment, you Absolutely. know, like, what is Jesus saying to you, you know, who is he in your life, make him the king and the prince of your life, and then, mm. you know, most people, you know, have the sense and the intelligence mm. and the goodness to go after God's heart and Absolutely. you know w w what is good for him. Um, Benjamin, we're slightly running out of time, and I feel like <laughs> we've only really like you know yeah. cracked the door open on 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 your life. And um, I just want to firstly say like thank you very much for yes, coming and joining us. Pleasure. Thank you for being so open and honest and sharing a bit about your faith and how. Yeah, Jesus has always been there for you, you know, you, yeah. through all the difficult times. Uh, I want to honour your mother and father in this and just... You, that, that means a lot. You know, we bless them. We pray for your mum. I hope I meet your dad in heaven, he sounds... Yeah. He'll be he dancing sounds, with banners. He yeah, he, sound, <laughs> watching this. So, he sounds yeah. great, you know. They, they used to watch God TV as well. So. Oh, did they? Awesome, <laughs> that's awesome. So he just sounds great. Yeah. Um, so does your mum. Um we're like rooting for you here at God TV. If there's anything we can do to support you, you know, here at God TV, get in touch, let us know, you know, don't be shy at all. And yeah, just we're praying for you. Like we're for you. We're just so grateful for you to just encourage all of us at home. Cause perhaps there are people at home that are listening that have lost a parent yeah. Yeah. and they can be encouraged that at the other side of it, Absolutely. I'm sure you still feel pain and loss and you miss it every day. Yeah. But yeah. you know that there's a life with Jesus after that mm. and that there is hope and yeah. you know God still has a purpose for you while you're mm. here on earth. Um, Benjamin, is there anything like we haven't spoken about or anything you want to speak about or anything you want to ask, you know, be, just to close the podcast off, you know? Mm. Um. I suppose apart from any kind of promotional things, then look, we could speak for hours. I think you there's can definitely a lot more. If you want, the, the, I, I will in a minute. I was just going to say that there's a lot of probably aspects of my life that I haven't brought up. They're a bit more positive. I started off quite negative. <laughs> Sorry for those who are listening. Didn't want to get too emotional too soon, but 
I think it's important for me to say that because of, I think a lot of the threads that I'm doing, whether it's the youth groups with um, the Teenagers Next Smith or it's the kind of bigger stuff that's on stage, it, it is about people ultimately. And I think through my own story, we've all got stories, some a lot worse than mine, you know. Um, it's all about perspective, but it's it's about actually relating and connecting. Well, it's my fault, Benjamin, because, you know, sometimes we want to know what your testimony is. And no, it's a good thing, so Sometimes you have to share the I'm saying it's a part. No, 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 you, you, I'm saying it's a positive because I think that, although I'd like to say a bit more about maybe the things that I'm doing and stuff, actually, if people are hearing this and are like, listen, he's gone from there to this, right. and the thread has been Jesus throughout. Amen. I mean, finding my wife even coming to Exmouth, and it's like going through all of that, coming to and meet my wife within the same year, who's also a Christian, is wonderful, obviously beautiful, and um, uh, very, Brooke, very good work. She's at Brooke, she's a worship leader. Yeah, shout okay, out to Brooke. Brooke. She yeah. does worship music. She runs the Lighthouse Ministries, which I think is re a really growing movement, actually, within Exmouth. Really exciting movement um, that we're doing. But we run worship nights like once a month and have got the young people to play in the instruments. We've got this incredible drummer called Yana who's like doing a grade at the moment. She's doing incredible and she's, yeah, so we're doing it at different venues in Exmouth. But yeah, I, I think I'd just like to say that it's, if you're hearing my story and whether you relate to it or not, um, hopefully there's a common thread of Jesus throughout and that's what I really want to portray. Um, and if there's anything that I didn't maybe say or um, for anyone in the past who, who has been through similar stuff, um, just just know that Jesus ultimately will be the answer and that just open your Bible a lot of the time. That's all it takes, you know. Do you, do you know what, Benjamin? Like The honest truth is it's impossible to speak about everything in it. Yeah. In our court. And, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which should definitely have talked to them about Brooke. We should definitely yeah, talk I was gonna about say, I mentioned it like 50 minutes. And and like, oh, no. You, know, you mentioned it and I was going to yeah, come back yeah, to it. Yeah, but, yeah. But, but the truth is, you, you, you know, like, a, you'll have to come back again mm. and let, We'd love to make yeah. we can solely talk about marriage <laughs> you know and yeah, yeah, yeah. how wonderful it is that god brings that yeah. and you know also like you know how you have to change as a man and exactly and yeah grow, that's a, that's class. an hour within itself isn't it yeah <laughs> and, and lead, lead in your faith you know in a, in a new and different way and and so you know yeah we haven't touched that but big shout out to brooke you absolutely know? yeah yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Like, and i just want to say thank you to you mate you've been a brilliant host and thank you for also shining a light on my mom and dad as well, because although the, the songs are about my dad, that particular song, I don't necessarily get to open up that much about him. So it's really right. special to me to be able to talk about him. Awesome. I don't get too much. Awesome. So it's, yeah, it's lovely to be able to do that. Yeah, you're welcome. Come on then, let's do, let's do some promotion. Like where can people go and, yep. you know, watch what you're doing and where you are next and yeah, yeah, how yeah. do we buy tickets and all that? <laughs> so um, Benjamin Haycock, uh, it's a bit of a mouthful, but once you get it, you've got it for life. Yeah. <laughs> On Spotify, YouTube, as I said, um, do a lot of music videos. I've got a music, I don't know when this will be broadcast, but I've got a music video coming out on the 24th alongside a new single called Sow and Reap, um, which has Christian elements to it as well. Um, but it's it's about kind of the times we're in, the energy crisis and people really struggling. So it kind of struggles that line. And and yeah, so listen to that, make your own judgments. And there's a music video behind that. Um, this is culminating into an EP. I realise I've said that word a lot and I'm sorry, um, but this is culminating into an EP. What does EP um, mean? EP, extended play. So it's okay. like, a, it's not an album. It's like four to six, right. could be eight tracks, but four to six tracks um, that I'm, I'm doing. And then I'm gonna hopefully lead. So that'll be in April. I haven't got a name for it that, but working on the final tracks with Noah. Um, in the summer, I'm looking, I'm doing festivals. I'm going to Nashville and doing a few things in America. Um, I've been working with Sofa Sounds recently, did a few sold out shows in Brighton and Bristol, which I'm incredibly proud of and hopefully, um, as we've spoke about in recent weeks with them, it's a long-term partnership all around the UK and more with them. The Extreme Tour is doing a lot with them, but um, yeah, look forward to plenty of music this year, um, Christian and non-music alike. Yeah, it, so it sounds great. And um, we have this little program called Amplified on God TV and it's a 30 minute worship show. Yeah, it's yeah. highlighting uh, new artists and, you know, um, well-known artists. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and what we try and do is get, like something that's culturally diverse so from you know lots of different countries because we broadcast course, you know yeah. australia asia africa mm. europe the yeah. nordics uk sort of a really broad audience um so if you have anything that is a little bit christian you know feel yeah, free to send absolutely. it across we'd love to put it on the show and yeah you know highlight highlight your work um 
I didn't want to say too much, but there is potentially a, a Christian EP coming. Oh, that, come on. But that, that, that's on. like in the autumn. He didn't, he didn't want to mention autumn. that, but that's now he's committed to it. So. No, because it's, I, I'm going to, no, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I'm putting no, it out in the world. It, that, that was God. He's like, put it out in the world. <laughs> yeah. There's responsibility that comes with saying, there's accountability, exclusive? you know. It's an like, exclusive? Might be, mate. Might yeah, be. come on. <laughs> yeah. You heard it here on God TV yeah. together. Benjamin's doing a Christian album. That's prophetic. That um, <laughs> now you've got thousands of people that uh, are going to hold you to account for it. Oh, come on, come on. That's good. Yeah, Benjamin, just again, thank you so much for today. Um, if you've been watching and you've got questions for Ben or, you know, indeed questions for God TV, go in the comments, like leave us any comments or questions um, or if there's any guests or if Benjamin's spoken about people and you'd like to know more about them, you know, maybe maybe you can yeah. reach out or any other work that Benjamin's doing as I well. I was going to say, maybe reach out to me on Instagram. That's probably the platform that I use the most and Facebook. Um, give me a follow on there and send me a message. You know, I've, I've always got a bit of time to reply to people. Um, and yeah, if you want to question me on anything, maybe challenge me, then by all means, you can. I'd love to answer. Yeah, amazing. Um, so you can get, get in touch with Benjamin on all his normal social media or uh, go to godtv.com um, or god.tv, whichever, and you can get in touch with us there. Uh, and, you know, if anything has affected you in today's programme, we do have call centres around the world, Benjamin, where people can call in Brilliant, for yeah. prayer um, or for ministry. Um, they're free. Mm. Um, so, yeah, you know, if you need to call the number, we'll put them in the comments and all the info and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. So that people, you know, if they need any support, can go and get prayer. And Amazing, um, yeah. we only minister, so we don't really try and uh, counsel people. But we've got all the agencies to forward people yeah, where yeah. they're going to get cared and and, and look, look looked after. So, you know, uh, Benjamin, on behalf of all of God TV, you know, thank and you, everyone you. listening, thank you for coming today, and uh, we wish you all the best. Thank you, mate. Appreciate it. You're welcome. <laughs>